Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. My name is George Knapp, your occasional host, designated driver of the airwaves and moderator of tonight's upcoming cacophonous cavalcade of conversation. Jay, welcome to Coast to Coast. Hey, I'm having such a good time listening to you run this program. It's really great. <laughs> Well, we try to have fun here. Uh, your book is so much fun to read, and, and it's a little scary, too. I'll tell you, I, I am a bit of a lunkhead when it comes to technology, so I tend to lean toward the view that Skynet is maybe just around the corner, killer robots, <laughs> e evil AI yeah. overlords, something like that. They'll keep us all around long enough to maybe work in the lithium mines. feels like you strike a much more balanced view of the future. I don't know if you have any kids, but if you do, what do you tell them in general about the future? Because a lot of it looks pretty grim. It depends. You know, you really have to kind of take a, a stance somewhere between optimism and pessimism. We all have to. And, um, you know, I, I think I'm an optimist, but I, it's, I would say it's a little harder to be generally optimistic about the future now than I feel it was, say, 30 years ago. And, you know, I mean, climate change, no matter what you believe is causing it, uh, obviously is having a huge impact, especially where you are in the southern U.S. I mean, the heat is, you know, this past summer was kind of unbearable. We had wildfires all over the place in Canada. And, uh, you know, those things are changing the globe. And it's hard for us to sort of look ahead very far because we're not really built to do that. And um, if you look ahead really far, you see there are some real risks. And climate change would be one. AI, you know, some people fear it's a real ex existential threat to us. I don't really think that. But you, there are good things and there are bad things, and you have to try and anticipate which ones will actually win the game. Climate change is one of those things that, like, well, like every other issue, at least in this country, everything is divided along partisan lines. And, and you know, there's a lot of folks, yeah. they, they stick their fingers in their ears and don't want to hear about it. They don't want to hear anything mentioned about it. They don't believe it's real. Uh, and if it is real, we didn't cause it, and there's nothing we can do about it, so move along. You know? Well, you know that, that line, we didn't cause it, I think is at the root of a lot of people wanting to plug their ears. Because let's face it, um, you know, uh, nobody wants to hear that what they're doing is wrong. Nobody wants to hear that some of the things they do are actually causing damage to the planet. I don't want to hear that. There are lots of things that I could and should change. But, you know, the evidence, I mean, it used to be 15 years ago, it all seemed a bit theoretical. Um, doesn't seem to me like it's theoretical now. And so we'll see, you know, next summer, if it's terrible, as I would say, much of last summer was. I mean, you know, we had a great summer in Calgary because it was, a little bit warmer, longer into the fall. But, you know, it can go from there to being out of control. And here's the thing. The technologies that we have to actually control climate change, you know, really we're not doing the easiest thing, which is cutting our emissions. Instead, we're looking at technologies like capturing the carbon dioxide and burying it deep in the earth so it never comes out again. Those are possible but it's going to take a long time to get those up and running to the degree that we need them to. So on the one hand, you can be optimistic. Yeah, there's technology, but you've got to be realistic too and say, well, you know, we're looking at decades and what's going to happen if we keep pumping carbon dioxide into the air through all those decades, it's not going to look good. I'll come back to that conversation a little bit later because you dive into some of the proposed uh, changes to to uh, affect climate change, including geoengineering, which has been discussed on this program a bunch of times. In general, though, predictions predictions of the future, they're tough. They're often wrong. 
Uh, you make the point that we really don't do a very good job of looking at the future or considering all the variables. We don't really question whether the things we're about to unleash are good ideas or not, do we? Well, you know what I think traditionally has been one problem is that people come up with uh, cool science, which leads to cool technology. And because it's so revolutionary, people want to apply it right away. And it's been rare in the past to kind of stand back a step and say, how is this going to impact people? Um, and who's it going to benefit? Is it only going to benefit the rich? Or could it possibly benefit everyone? So you look at something like cell phones. I mean, there are countries that basically skipped landlines and went from no phones or very few phones to cell phones. It was fantastic for them. But you can also look at some of the efforts, uh, especially in Silicon Valley, uh, promoting the idea of extending life from not just like 100 years to 150 years or more, um, who's that going to benefit? I, I strongly suspect it's the, you know, the, big, the billionaires and the big brains in Silicon Valley who think, boy, if I could live 150 years, think of the benefits I could give the world. Yeah. So you know, I don't really think they're thinking about working class people who are a little worried about what their, how their job is going to turn out in two or three years. And they're not worried about living to 150. You mentioned about these life extension efforts in one ch chapter of the book, and, and you're right. It's I've already read about these tech billionaires who spend all their hours every day exercising, taking vitamins, doing what they can to to stop the aging process so they can basically live forever. And I don't know, it just strikes me as kind of contrary to having a happy life. If you're spending all your time extending it, you're probably missing out on a lot of the things that make life worth living. I just read a, I don't even remember the guy's name, but I just read an article about a guy who is doing exactly what you just said, devoting, he's devoting his entire life to extending that life. And then you think there's kind of an irony there, right? Like, is he going to football games? Is he enjoying Thanksgiving dinner? No, he's taking 212 pills a day and, you know, making sure he sleeps in some sort of weird bed. And I just think, you know, there is serious research on aging, and that is often actually being done by good scientists that Silicon Valley uh, companies have hired. So Google has some of the best uh, biologists who are interested in aging working for their lab or their company, Calico. But there's a difference, right, between people looking at small organisms and saying, what are the secrets to the fact that if you do this to them, they live twice as long? How does that work? There's a big difference between that and a guy lying in a specially lit bed taking his pills. <laughs> and I, I think I, like I'm interested in aging as a scientific challenge, but I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do the 212 pills a day. You know, predictions are tough. You, you have a quote from Arthur C. Clarke in your book, uh, basically, I'm paraphrasing, only if I tell you what is absolutely, uh, only what I tell you is absolutely unbelievable will we have a chance of accurately visualizing the future. That the future is so yeah. hard to predict, we can't even, we can't even imagine what it's going to be. I love Arthur C. Clarke, not just because he was a great science fiction author, but and he did make lots of predictions, but they weren't all accurate, and like, there is nobody that I know of who is always accurate. But he had this wonderful sense that you just alluded to, where he also said, besides what you just said, he said, you know, to get an idea of the limits of the possible, you have to push a little bit further into the impossible. And he's absolutely convinced, was absolutely convinced, that if you and I were talking about future possibilities, the crazier they sounded, the more likely they were to be accurate. And he said, like, run-of-the-mill predictions, if they happen, it doesn't really matter. It's the really exciting things will be the things that you thought were impossible. And suddenly there they are. Like you said at the very beginning, having a phone in your hand that you put in your pocket when you walk around. 
Uh, let's start with, you know, you, you do a great job of looking at multiple possible scenarios for each of these topics you consider. Um, let's start with bodies, our, our bodies, humans. Uh, are we still evolving? And will we end up with huge heads that are portrayed in so many sci-fi scenarios <laughs> as you describe in your book? What do you think? Well, uh, <laughs> I love the huge heads, you know. Um, I, there, was a, there was an episode of The Outer Limits in, back in 1963 where a guy was propelled a million years into the future of human evolution. And all that really happened as he progressed through those hundreds of thousands of years was that his head got enormous, like enormous. And he grew a sixth finger on each hand. And I thought this was this was actually pretty funny. Where did you guys get this idea that that's what would happen to us? But that's a million years. Nobody can predict anything about that. But if you look at like a century, you know, that's that's an amazing time from now, say, to 2123 in terms of what technologies we'll see that will be different. But I would bet you... And, of course, I won't be around to, you know, either congratulate myself or admit defeat. But I'll bet you we won't look significantly different. Like, if you go back, George, honestly, um, thousands of years, we are physically, at least in appearance, pretty much exactly the same. That doesn't mean we're not evolving. We have sets of genes in the human genome that are being turned over and new ones being you know, mutated and old ones disappearing all the time. It's just that they're making changes at a kind of biochemical level that you could never detect by looking at someone. And if you speak about our brains, our brains are about the same size now as they were 100,000 years ago. Uh, Actually, Neanderthal people had bigger brains than we do. So the idea that um, as we move into the future, our brains are going to continue getting bigger. There's just no evidence for that. And I think, you know, you can talk about the future without making predictions. Uh, the only prediction about humans I would make is we may change chemically. Uh, maybe skin color will change gradually. Who knows? But we're going to look pretty much the same. You you have some facts in, in your book that really jumped out at me. I had no idea. You You mentioned that Dutch men are three inches taller than Americans, and they used to be a lot shorter in general. What happened there? Well, so nutrition is always part of it. And um, the Dutch um, actually had endured a huge famine in World War II. And coming out of that, when uh, nutrition was brought back up to normal uh, levels, they started to grow. And, you know, it's probably true that there was a set of genes circulating in the Netherlands that that prompted uh, height. But then um, as the population changes and a lot of people move from other countries into the Netherlands, actually their height advantage is now starting to shrink. Jay Ingram, one section of your book looks at um, technological changes, uh, ways to improve the human body. And some of those are already happening now, How uh, you know, prosthetics and things of that sort. But you, you dig into uh, taking a, a step further I know one of the most entertaining things that I read in that section was about wings. Uh, You know, it's a dream of people to be able to fly. We don't have to wait for flying cars if we develop artificial wings. What's what's the chances of something like that happening? (laughs) (laughs) Well, you you did a good job of picking up on a kind of innocent comment by a guy. Uh, But it's an interesting comment. So that comment came from a guy named Hugh Herr. H-E-R-R. He's an MIT prof, and he, and he works on prosthetics. He lost both his uh, lower legs uh, in a frostbite case when he was climbing. And he, he designs amazing prosthetics. He helped a ballroom dancer who had lost the lower part of her left leg in the, in the Boston Marathon terrorist bombings 10 years ago. And he, with a crew of four other people, designed this amazing prosthetic lower leg and foot that allowed her to ballroom dance again. And so he, he's a big proponent on, you know, um, technology that can not just replace lost abilities, but go even beyond. And if he, if you ask him, Hugh Herr, to think about the end of this century, 
like, say, the year 2100, like you said, he's convinced that people will be able to fly, and he thinks that they will, that many people will become kind of super athletes. I think that's pretty far out. I mean, you know, I'm not as confident about that as I am about flying cars, because, you know, you know. It's a joke, right? Flying yeah. cars have been, we've been dreaming of them since the 1950s. But in the Paris Olympics next summer, they've already promised they're going to be using flying cars to transport people somewhere from in the city of Paris to where the Olympics will be. So the thing is, you know, what do people think of when they think of a flying car? They think of the, you know, Jetsons. the chassis of a car with wings and a tail. And, there were some built like that, you know, 50 and 60 and 70 years ago. They didn't fly very well. They didn't drive very well. And somehow they never flourished. And I think if you see them at the Paris Olympics, you're going to be disappointed if you're expecting a car with wings and a tail. It's going to be more like a, like a drone, a quadcopter. And, you know, that. But you know what? In the long run, George, I don't think they're going to be a big deal. I just can't imagine uh, if they ever became like a widespread consumer product. People can't drive cars with four wheels on the road. Well, exactly. And the thing is, so, so some of these early ones, like the mid 20th century ones, actually, um, I mean, they flew. They were able to run along the ground and fly. But then you think, OK, where are you going to have it? You, you can't have it in your garage. It's got this huge wing spread. Okay, so you park it in your driveway. Are you telling me you're going to back out onto the street and then run down the street and take off? Like, it's it's just, you know, when you start thinking, it's like I said before, not just about the technology, but who's going to benefit from it? I have a feeling that there might be some rich people living in somewhere in the country who have their own little flying car that they then fly to the nearest either train station or airport to take another plane? I don't know. I just can't see them. And like you say, you know, those visions of future science fiction cities with multiple layers of flying lanes and flying cars crisscrossing, I don't think that's ever going to happen. You know, I have to admit to having a bit of melancholy, <clears throat> excuse me, melancholy in thinking about uh, us as a species evolving into something else, melding with machines, sort of becoming a version of cyborgs. I, I can't help but think that the first people who do those kinds of things, who become the $6 million man or a version of that they're in uh, and have the ability to compete against the rest of us, have great advantages, uh, others will follow. And, um, you know, in, in, in some ways we're headed that way anyway. You, you mentioned about transhumanism and, and I think the, the Elon Musk um, Neuralink uh, project um, there could be great benefits from that, of course, but gosh, uh, it's, I'm going to be sad to see humans go. Well, you're absolutely right. Like there are, so mostly Elon Musk's company, Neuralink, does these brain implants where you actually embed um, about a dime-sized piece of metal in a skull, and there are maybe a thousand electrodes that sort of spread out over the surface of the brain and record the activity of the brain. And if you train, you know, if you have people who have lost the ability to speak for one reason or the other, but still can formulate things that they want to say in their heads, and you can read that brain activity with a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of com training the computer, you can turn that brain activity into the words the person would have been able to say had they not had the disease or the injury or whatever. And that's, you know, that's a huge benefit uh, for people that haven't been able to speak maybe for years. But, you know, Elon Musk, sorry, I shouldn't laugh. He's the richest man in the world. Um, but Elon Musk wants to say that they want to recruit their first human patient for a Neuralink implant. Other people have been doing implants, but not Neuralink. They want to recruit their first patient. Then he said, we want to increase the broadband between two people's brains or one person's brain and AI. And then you just have to think, what is he talking about? 
Like, okay, let's say you and I have a Neuralink brain implant, and does that mean that I'll be able to know your thoughts or you'll be able to know mine? That could be very treacherous. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, I think Elon Musk, he, he does have this dream or vision that a human brain linked to AI would suddenly become much more powerful. And you know what? We have no idea if that's possible. I mean, it's not like, you know, I, I'm, my brain is more powerful because I can go to Wikipedia and learn things that I didn't learn. This is supposed, supposedly instantaneous floods of information moving back and forth between artificial intelligence and humans. And when you mentioned transhumanism, you know, this, this use of technology to go beyond the mortal human body, a lot of the attention on that these days is exactly that. Link a human brain to AI or maybe upload a whole human brain to the cloud. Yeah. I mean, these are what people are talking about. I would never predict. I, I wouldn't make a prediction on that. It's just too dicey. There's so many you know, variables that could go wrong. But there are people that want to do this. Well, Ray Kurzweil was a, a guest on this program with me a couple of years ago uh, here to talk about the singularity, the the time that he says is coming soon. And he's one of these guys, a brilliant guy who is taking a bunch of vitamins, trying to hang on long enough till we get to the point where he could essentially upload his brain, his consciousness into a computer and live on and be basically an eternal digital creature. Would you do that? Would you upload yourself? Would I? Yeah. If you could? Um, well, you know, I wouldn't say no right off the, the bat. Um, I think <laughs> it would, I don't know, it would depend if, if it was put to me this way. Okay, we're going to upload your brain. If, it, if you feel like it didn't work <laughs> after we did it. <laughs> that's too uh, bad. <laughs> you, yeah, that's too bad. See, I would then say, no, I don't think so. But if they say, look, it's reversible and we'll have a version of your brain in the cloud, but you know, and you can, but you're going to keep your own. Um, I don't know. I, I just think it's that same question that I posed before who who's going to have this done. You know, I mean, we're going to have by 2050, we're going to have 10 billion people on the planet. Uh, I don't think very many of them are going to have their brains converted to ones and zeros and, and, you know, uplifted to the cloud. So while it's an entertaining idea, I think I think the thing that's good about it is that it sparks other related ideas, some of which might be useful. But um, I'm not uh, going to sit up at night waiting for that to happen. Right. There's a friend of mine who is really a genius in the uh, cutting edge virtual reality uh, tech and where that's headed. That, and you touch on it in your book, uh, the the future of us. Uh, the idea of uh, uh, living in a virtual world, the metaverse. I, I can remember seeing the people reacting to the movie Avatar. They wanted to live on Pandora. They went back to the theater over and over because they wanted to live in that life. And I can imagine a lot of folks who don't like where they live now um, wanting to live in some virtual world altogether. This guy believed that eventually we could uh, we could do everything in the virtual world that we can do in the physical world, and it might lead to a new avenue for eventual evolution. We could evolve into a species that isn't physical at all. Uh, you well, ready to go there? Yeah, Talk no, about that? <laughs> well, you know, I actually think, here, here's what part of that I think probably is already happening and will happen, and that is the ability to simulate a world just with technology. So I'm sitting talking to you, but if I had the right kind of gear, and it's not going to be clumsy, you know, VR helmets or anything like that, but, and it's going to take, it's going to input more senses than just visual and auditory, but, you know, also smells and touch and everything else. If you could, if you could have that kind of information coming in, and that was the, you know, 95% of your sensory input was digital then I don't see why, like, I don't think that's impossible at all. And I don't see why you couldn't say, take a trip 
to the Serengeti and and be on a safari and have an utterly convincing surround that uh, is indistinguishable from actually being at the on the Serengeti. I, I think that's going to happen. But of course, and you you hinted at this a while ago. Um, that does lead to the idea of are we living in a computer simulation, an idea that I love to think about and talk about. Well, let's let's jump into it, then. Uh, we can do it here. Uh, it, it is a fascinating question. I guess the bottom line would be, what difference would it make? There's nothing you could do about it. Um, that is the bottom line. And I think, I mean, in a way, the way to answer that is, Let's say we are living in some computer simulation. I, I think you said it before, some sort of weird teenage alien kid with a very powerful computer running a program of you know life on Earth in the 21st century. Um, but if you look at how computer power is advancing, and again, not that we want to quote Elon Musk all the time, but you know he made that point that the first video games like Pong and Asteroids, look at what's happened since then. They're now multiplayer, multi-character, incredibly realistic. Well, that's only in, what, 50 years? So what about another 150 with incredibly advanced computers? Uh, It just seems conceivable that that could be the case. But as you say, does it really matter? Because if we're living in one, this is the world we know. And, you know, you're, you're not going to be living in a simulation and saying, oh, I wish I could see a real flower. I bet they're better than these digital flowers. But if all you've ever seen is a digital flower, then, you know, that's your life. Um, one of the interesting questions that you have that you come to before saying, does it really matter? And I agree with you. I don't think it really matters. But could you tell? Is there any way of telling that we're living in a computer simulation. And and people like to say it's a the let's say this kid in the future that's running our simulation. Um, computers cost money even then. And, and you know, programming capacity and com- chip speed or whatever they're using for computing then will always have a cost. And so if this let's call him a kid or her a kid Uh, in the future, they don't want to spend a whole bunch of money creating a simulation for us that's exact, even to the sub-microscopic physics. They're just going to make things seem pretty good, right? Like when Disney uh, has an animation of a lake in a cartoon, they don't use the laws of, you know, chromodynamics or, or optics to make that. They just make it look pretty good. And the theory is that If you see something weird happen one day, like something changes, something looks suddenly different, that's a clue to the programmer discovering that people are starting to get onto the game. They're starting to understand there's something not really real about this, and so he or she tweaks it. But, you know, that's kind of silly. Nobody nobody encounters that. So I just think... You know, it's a, it's a nice way of sort of speculating about the nature of reality. So I'm a big fan of that. Yeah, it's fun. Uh, I'm thinking of the movie The Truman uh, Show, um, where he's, uh, his yeah, whole life is a exactly. TV show. And uh, Well, and, and you know, um, there's, there's lots of – The Matrix is a, another kind of example. But in our, in our simulation – as far as we know, we can't leave it but because where would we go? We're like simulated ourselves. So we'd better, one person, at least one person has argued that we should take steps to make our simulation interesting enough <laughs> that the person running it won't get tired of it and just slam the laptop and go and have lunch. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we got to be, we got to have interesting characters in the world and larger-than-life characters, Elvis Presley, the Beatles, you know, and sinister people, too, just to keep this programmer interested in keeping our simulation going. Yeah, that section of your book made me smile. That was pretty good. You know, don't sit at home watching TV. Don't spend your whole life doing that. Get out and do something interesting and keep us all alive while you're at it. Um, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. 
Uh, you touch on um, robots and the future of robots. And, of course, I've got this uh, paranoia every time I see these robot dogs that are, uh, I think it's Boston Dynamics, a company that builds these things, robot yep. guard yeah, dogs. I'm thinking, those. okay, here we go. This is the beginning of the end. Um, some of those uh, those changes are amazing. Uh, and and really, the, the innovation is, is spec- spectacular and impressive. But I wonder, worry about, I've seen these, I think that company is starting to use these humanoid-shaped robots in warehouse jobs. And what happens to everybody else's jobs who do those kind of things now when robots take care of all that? Yeah, you know, I, there's multiple things about robots that I, we have to think about. But I, I, so let's take the things you've mentioned. Like There are, I mean, we've had robots on car assembly lines for decades, right? Yep. And they they are very narrow in their abilities. They do one thing, but the fact is they do that one thing for 24-7, uh, and they never complain. So so there are going to be lots of robots that don't look like humans, that maybe fly like they're combinations of drones and some intelligence. So I think we're going to have lots. People have seriously are seriously looking at, robot caregivers uh, for people with dementia. Uh, And I mean, in a good sense, not in a sort of morbid, weird sense, but just if, if somebody has dementia and has no family and you've got a convincing humanoid that will talk to them, will spend time with them, give them companionship. uh, I don't see anything wrong with that. Jay Ingram, I I sort of use dark humor in talking about my subconscious fears about robots and AI and things of that sort. But I I recognize, and your book really documents, too, the amazing uh, changes that have happened and the uh, astonishing uses that robots and that kind of technology have already been put to. I mean, I'm thinking about there's two robots that we sent to Mars, these rovers, on Mars, and one of them has its own helicopter. It's It's astonishing. Uh, it, I guess it, yeah. it is better to send robots or machines than to send people on deep space missions. Same for deep ocean missions. I mean, police use robots in dangerous situations, the military as well. There are, there are great things that they can do that are better for them to do than humans, right? Absolutely. And, um, you know, can I turn this around a bit? Uh, sure. When people think that um, uh, we have alien species visiting us on Earth, Um, One of the things that I think you should keep in the back of your mind is by the time we get to the technological point where we're actually venturing not, you know, much further than Mars, even, let's say, out of the solar system, are we likely to send humans or would we be sending robots at that point? Because they can be loaded with super sophisticated AI, can probably make all the decisions that a human would be able to make in a spacecraft if there's an emergency, and there'd be no risk to a human. And um, so when we start looking for aliens, whether we're looking for them, you know, flying through our own Earth's atmosphere, or whether we're searching for signals from exoplanets around distant stars, I think we're a little bit limited in thinking, okay, we should look at planets that are a bit like the Earth, that probably have water, and, you know, maybe there'll be living things there. That may be true, but those living things, if they're technologically more advanced than us, uh, may be opaque to us, like they may be invisible. They may not want to be discovered. Or if we do see evidence of them, it's probably robots or mechanical things, not not actually flesh and blood things. So I think totally agree. for yeah. aliens yeah. is going to be tough. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I think that um, most of what we think of as UFOs probably are just machines, not without living beings in it. And things that we think of as aliens may, in fact, be robotic, synthetic creatures uh, that, are, that are sent here to do the job and are avatars, in a sense. I, I think that is entirely possible. You got you have a section that deals with, uh, with aliens. I was surprised to see it uh, toward the end of the book, but I, I appreciate that you— you have some fun with it, but you don't uh, just entirely dismiss the whole thing altogether. You know, there's a there's sort of a big split in if you look at the entire population uh, in the world of, of people who think that there are aliens. It sort of divides into two. 
uh, people that believe they've actually been here or are coming here, or we have evidence that they've been here, and people who don't believe that, who don't think that they've been here, and yet have the faith, given the number of planets around the number of stars in the number of galaxies, it just seems incomprehensible that there can't be life in many other places. I don't care, you know, how, how specifically difficult it is to start life, just given the sheer numbers of possibilities. And, you know, once you have life, is it, does it happen that you get intelligent life as we have on this planet? That's our whole problem, right, George, is that we're re- reasoning from one example. Us. Exactly. And we may be in the universe, in the universal context, we may be an anomaly, you know, that really there are many intelligent races, but they sort of haven't um, developed in the same way we have. I think it's like it's totally fascinating. I love one of the science fiction books I've always loved is by uh, a now dead astronomer cosmologist named Fred Hoyle called The Black Cloud. And he envisions this alien cloud, gigantic cloud, floating through the galaxy, gathering energy from stars that it passes. And it has a giant brain, and it actually moves, threatens the Earth, because it moves between us and the sun, blocking sunlight. But it, it isn't so much the story or the plot or anything. It's the fact that instead of envisioning big-headed little green men, Fred Hoyle said, look, it doesn't even have to have a surface to live on, right? It doesn't have to be on a planet or a moon. No. It can just float through the universe. Yeah. And uh, that really changed my thinking when I read that. I, I've had conversations with people at SETI. Now, they, they are operating under faith in an extent. They've been looking for alien signals for a long time, haven't found any, but there are some deep thinkers and smart people there, obviously, who realize that our galaxy is relatively young, that there are uh, other galaxies way older, and that if life evolved in those other places, there could be species that are a million or two million years older than us. Imagine where we will be in two million years. To uh, to them, we would be insects. To, to us, they would yeah. be gods. We, we might not even recognize them. Uh, uh, they're, so this they're, ties into the computer simulation sure. argument, too, because... Yeah. And I should say that it's, you know, you, you and I find it kind of amusing and it's fun to talk about, but philosophers have taken this idea seriously for at least the last two decades. And one of the arguments goes this way. Let's, what are the possibilities that we're in a simulation? Well, um, it would take, first of all, a civilization has to reach the technological sophistication to be able to create a simulation. Uh, and maybe most of them destroy themselves one way or the other before they get there. Okay, so that might happen. Or maybe they get there and they're just not interested in doing it. That's also possible. But if neither of those two things are true, then it's kind of inevitable that we're in a simulation. You know, if they last that long and they want to do it, they will be able to do it. So uh, that's why I love this this kind of thinking, because – connects, you know, that, so the computer simulation connects to the search for aliens, which in turn, you know, connects to what should we look for? What are they going to be like? You said like a million years. Well, you know, we have no concept whatsoever no. of what a million years in the future will be like. Assuming we don't blow ourselves up. Uh, I want to, before I leave robots altogether, I don't want to focus too much on my paranoia about robots, but you know, I remember as a kid learning about the future, you know, and in the future we will have robots doing all the hard work for us and humans can play the lute and eat grapes and write poetry all the time. And I, I think that would be really cool, except I think our corporate masters will not pay people to write poetry and eat grapes when the robots do the work. So I'm not sure they bring the rest of us along when robots take over and do all the all the hard jobs. But can I say one thing about this is, and that when you think about um, you know, all the science fiction that has been put out about artificial intelligence and robots. One of the scariest was the computer HAL 9000 in 2001, yeah. and it was not a robot. 
it was just a console on a spacecraft, but it controlled everything. And so it could send astronauts out into space, never to return. It could kill them while they're hibernating. It, you know, it, the only thing that prevented it from killing every single human on that space station was that you could turn it off. You could close its circuits. And people now who are afraid, they're really afraid more of giant computers like that than actual humanoid robots. But they also say, look, if, if AI gets to the point where it's not just as intelligent as us, but a little more intelligent than us, it will surely have thought that you might try and unplug it if things go bad. Yeah. It won't let that happen. You know, it will have more control in that. And I don't, I think people have been sold on the idea that there'll be, you know, mass invasions of marching robots when in fact, it just could be the AI in your building that has gone rogue. I mean, I'm, now wait, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I, don't, I think it's a mistake to think of a, a marauding army when control can be exerted much more subtly than that. Yeah, I, I think it's also a mistake to just rush headlong into AI without at least slowing down and thinking about it a little bit. Totally. Because it, it just seems to me that if it does become self-aware, that you know, we have these engineers at Google saying that, their system had become self-aware. Uh, um, I'm yeah. not sure I would let us know. If I were that AI, I'm not sure I'd let the new humans know I was self-aware. Uh, uh, and I'm not sure that we can put handcuffs on them, um, these systems, that if they eventually develop consciousness and are much smarter than us. Well, you, you make a really good point about, um, you know, could they become self-aware? Would, we, would they, if they were self-aware, even let us know they have that capability? And one of the most... Interesting things about the AI, like chatbots that have, you know, taken the world by storm. Um, we don't really know how internally they work because we haven't programmed them. We haven't taught them. We have set them up to, you know, reach certain goals, and they figure out how to do that. So even the, you know, the simple version of that would be the great chess playing and go playing uh, AIs. We don't know how they taught themselves, but that's how they learned how to play chess. And they can play, they play simulated games against each other or against themselves. And they can do that a million times in a day. So it's no wonder that they get to be fantastic players. And we don't know what's going on. We assume they don't really know that they're playing a game. We assume they're just trying to achieve the goal, but we don't know what's going on in their minds, and that is a little unsettling. Yep. Um, we'll take a call or two. I've got so much more ground to cover with uh, Jay Ingram, but we'll take a call or two. Let's go east of the Rockies, Warren in Pennsylvania. Hey, Warren, you're on with Jay Ingram. Hi. Uh, hi, gen gentlemen. Um, uh, yeah, I, Jay, I, I, I liked your point that, uh, that the simulator, if there is a simulator, it would be uh, computationally limited. Because you know, you know how it is. You know, I got a fancy laptop now, but the programs don't really run any faster than uh, you know old Lotus One Two Three and Word Perfect from the late 1980s. And so, <laughs> wouldn't uh, a direct prediction of the simulation be uh, the, the Fermi hypothesis itself, or the, or the Fermi paradox, I should say? Because consider this: uh, look at some of these you know fancy scientific instruments that we've built. They seem they all break down. Hubble telescope, the mirror was screwed up. The Long Hadron Collider, they blew it up the first time they, they ran it. It took years to fix. Kepler, they're finding thousands and thousands of exoplanets, but the gyroscopes break down early. James Webb's telescope is working, but it took an inordinate amount of time to build. All of these examples would allow the simulator time to catch up, you might say, and generate uh, reality for these instruments to later detect. Yeah, but, that's, um, a, that's a really interesting point. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, the, because the way it's sometimes put is that physicists on Earth who are simulated but nonetheless, you know, are smart and do physics, they get to the point where it looks like they're going to de detect these flaws. Then, yeah, the programmer just tweaks the flaw. 
And I think you're absolutely right that the, the amount of time and effort and cost we'd be putting into detecting whether this is a simulation or not could, given that these, whoever's doing it is well into the future, right, and using uh, computational technology that we can't even envision, should be able to correct that pretty easily. Um, but, you know, I, this is like... You know what? You know deja vu, where you've uh, experienced, you're in a room and suddenly you feel like you've been in that room before, but you never were. Um, there are people that have argued that deja vu is a perfect example of the programmer fixing a little glitch. And there's a little bit of stumble in time and you're in a place and you feel like you've been there before, but you really haven't because they, they had to tweak a little something in the time <laughs> you know, and how time went. Um, these are all just wild guesses, really. And um, I think if we're in a simulation, totally, 100%, we're probably never going to know it. Yeah, glitches in the matrix we could look for, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's fun, right? I mean, it's yeah. fun to think about. Um, it is. Yeah, so um, I, at this point, I'm content to to think about it and listen to the arguments, and, and they're they're interesting to talk about. Thanks for the call, Warren. We'll try one more call. Uh, uh, west of the Rockies, Ron in Washington. Hey, Ron. Long time, Art Bell. Uh, What's up? How close are we right now, or do we even have it right now? Uh, the Brainstorm technology, which was uh, Natalie Wood's film, where you get oh, yeah. more. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know anything about specifically that technology. Can you? Quickly explain it to me. A person would attach electrodes to their scalp. Yeah. And they would uh, skydive or take a ride in a fighter jet. Oh, yeah. Well, I'd say, they yeah. They'd come back, and it's... another person would put the electrodes on their, on their scalp, and they'd do a playback, and the person lives that experience. It's like a virtual so, reality, um, uh, Jay. Yeah, so I think, I mean, we're close to it in uh, in a different kind of sense. Uh, electrodes on the scalp just don't pick up uh, the signals from the brain, the electrical activity of the brain cells, clearly enough because, it's, you know, it's passing through the skull and it gets dampened by the bone and so on. But when you're talking, as I was earlier, about brain implants, where you actually have electrodes on sitting not just on the skull, but on the surface of the brain itself, then you're getting really clear signals. And so any, any suggestion that, yes, we can record from the brain, we can create a memory of that, we can simulate somebody's brain activity with a computer, all of that I think is either just, is just starting to happen. But it's you know, it's going to take a long time because it's very expensive. It requires a lot of people working on it. And in the so far, it's benefited a handful of people who were having trouble communicating. That's going to get way better. And then I don't, I don't think we can predict how far that's going to go. In your book, you touch on virtual reality and some of the benefits that, uh, that are accruing now. I mean, uh, that people would be able to experience nature, that there are, in fact, physical benefits, psychological benefits from spending time in nature, and that virtual reality uh, could achieve the same thing without for people who can't get out into nature itself, right? Yeah, and, you know, I think that um, a lot of uh, environmental pe people that spend time in nature would be quite skeptical that you could derive the same kind of psychological benefits from a simulation of that. But you know, the, the Japanese uh, have been, uh, they actually coined the term forest bathing, where you, you know, you don't, you don't have to undress in the forest, but just, you know, immerse yourself in the forest and you do feel better. And there are even changes in your metabolism that, um, you know, you can, you can see changes in blood pressure and various chemicals in the blood. Now, here's the thing. You get a lot of the same benefits, even if you have a screen surrounding you, so you don't see the trees and the 
rocks and the grass and the birds and everything. You're, you're actually still getting something from the air because you're in a forest, but you can't see anything. And that, I just think that the more you push that, once you start to identify what's in the air that might be making you feel better, I don't see why that can't be simulated. Apparently, there are even experiments suggesting that people watching videos of nature, like the Attenborough specials, you know, planet Earth, actually lower their blood pressure and and feel better. So I don't think it's impossible that you could get the benefits of nature uh, in a virtual way. What really we should be doing is designing cities that incorporate more trees, more natural grassy areas, you know, a pavement that doesn't let the water run off that actually soaks it in. Really try and mimic nature in the design of cities, I think, would be better for everyone. Absolutely. Uh, on the wild card line, Brandon in Austin, Texas. Hey, Brandon, how you doing? Hey, can you hear me? Yes, I can. What's on okay, your mind? Perfect. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Uh, if you haven't followed uh, George Knapp's podcast, you got to do that. It's an honor. Thank you, guys, George and Jay. Um, since AI was created in our timeline, it's only logical that that's why time travelers, both organic or inorganic or AI, would come to our time space because that's when our decisions are being made for when this stuff is being created. So our time space is a battleground, like the movie Terminator. just wanted to say that, but I wish I had a, enough time to ask you about Bob Lazar and hydrogen, but I don't think we have enough time. But the Weather Channel five days ago mentioned the ozone hole is regrowing after it was healing because of the use of refrigerants, and we're using more refrigerants because the global temperatures are rising, which causes more use of refrigerants, and it's an exponentiating feedback loop. And uh, we found out that it's possibly a, a record size, and it's three times the size of Brazil, and that it could possibly be coming from CFCs from China and India. We can't re control them. Uh, it said it was delayed 10 years, the recovery, and what happens if next year is another 10 years? Uh, also, they said that the aerosols from wildfires and the Tonga eruption last year is also destroying the ozone could a culmination of all these things especially all at once like we're experiencing now uh come to a tipping point that the ozone becomes too much and with art bell somebody mentioned that earlier uh amazing man he wrote the quickening in 1971 and that mentioned people living excuse me uh in domes and there was other depictions of people living on domes Many people have seen pictures of the moon and Mars uh, with domes on them. Do you think that Earth's atmosphere could be affected by the ozone and we could end up being like Mars? <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot to chew on. That would be a long stretch. <laughs> I don't think um, that the increase in the size of the ozone hole is going to make us like Mars. Um, but you raise a good point, which is... Uh, why, what can we do about it? If, you know, this is a whole problem. An action in one place has a reaction in a different place that you didn't expect. We figured after the 1987 Montreal Protocol, that, you know, to agree to lower the content of chlorofluorocarbons, we're, we were going to be, you know, out of the woods when it came to the ozone hole. And now it turns out, as you say, that there's new evidence that it's growing. And it's very difficult to look at every technology, like you made the point, refrigerants as, as the climate warms, um, we can't really do without refrigerants. How are we going to cope with this? You know, it reminds me of the Green Revolution, which, you know, in the 50s and 60s especially, re completely revamped agriculture and is estimated to have saved maybe 800 million lives. But at the same time, it, caused, it used more herbicides, more pesticides, more water, more fossil fuels to run farm machinery, all of which are having a negative effect on us. So it's very difficult. If you could predict, the most important thing to predict would be not which technology is going to work best, but which technology is going to have the least impact on everything else and still do what it's supposed to do. 
Thanks for that, Brandon. You know, we didn't touch on this yet, but you have a section about geoengineering, how, how there are some pretty ambitious proposals about how to combat environmental change, climate change with by spraying things in our skies. There are those who think that we're already doing this. It's some secret government plot is we're spraying chemicals in there to control climate and weather. Um, give me your take on geoengineering, uh, how likely it is that something like that might be instituted and uh, whether or not there are better alternatives? Well, there's lots of alternatives, um, but one of the issues now is time. If we don't reduce our emissions, because as I said earlier, that's the easiest and cheapest way to limit the amount of carbon dioxide and therefore the amount of warming. If we don't do that, then we really only have two as long as we're continuing to emit carbon dioxide, we have kind of two technological choices. We can try and capture the carbon dioxide and bury it. Um, we're very, very slow at getting to that. The other thing, the, the beauty of geoengineering, and there are ways of doing it, but the most controversial is what you mentioned, putting sulfates up into the upper atmosphere, just as happens after volcanic eruptions. When Mount Pinatubo erupted in 1991, in the months following, the Earth's temperature dropped two degrees Celsius. So the thing about geoengineering is we know it can work fast, and that sets it apart from trying to capture carbon, which will take a long time. You can, you can change the Earth's temperature by reflecting some sunlight back into space from these sulfate particles, but, you know, what if... What if Canada decides we want to cool off and our big cloud of sulfate particles drifts in the stratosphere over the U.S. and the U.S. doesn't want to cool off <laughs> or vice versa? You know, suddenly you've got, you've got grounds for conflict just because we don't really know how these things are going to move in the atmosphere. And so I support some small-scale experiments, but even those are controversial. People are really up in arms about geoengineering. But I think it'd be worth doing small-scale experiments because they'd only last a couple of weeks, and then whatever had happened is, you know, gone. And let's see if we can control and manipulate the temperature, because in the end, even though it's risky, we might have to do it faster than we're able to actually capture carbon dioxide. Charles in Sebastopol, California, on the wild card line. Hi, Charles. What's on your mind? Thanks for taking the call. A um, couple of things. I'm squeezing them in. I was going to ask you about the movie Her, which I think is really interesting because I think it portrays a really realistic vision of what AI, distributed AI, might be in, say, 10, 15 years from now. But the question I really wanted to ask is, right now we're in what's called an experiential economy. That is the highest values placed not on physical things, or rather on experience, and there's many different vectors to, to measure this by. So my thought would be, okay, so we go with the mind link or neural implant to the next step. I think the next big commercial breakthrough is going to be sort of like brainstorm, where you can deliver experiences on command. Um, you can even do things like take a certain kind of drug, but only be on that drug for 10 minutes or something, and then you go back to normal. In other words, it may not be distributed to many people. I, I think this is going to be like the landed gentry of the neural future, but nonetheless, for those that can afford it or want to, and also I think for pe people in college or people in highly competitive jobs where they want to have added emphasis to their cognitive abilities and certainly to their intelligence capacity, exactly this is what it means. It's like the implant of Adderall, if you will. So, I mean, I think this really is going to be coming around the corner. I just wonder if you had a similar thought. Um, you're, you're saying you think implants will be a big deal? Yes. For the chosen few that want them, yes. Yeah, so, you know, I, I think we shouldn't underestimate the um, the difficulty of doing implants safely. Um, so we would, we've been talking about Elon Musk's company, Neuralink, and uh, they did a lot of experiments with a lot of macaque monkeys, implanting, doing neural implants and then experimenting. And just a week and a half ago, Wired magazine made a claim that um, many of these macaque monkeys were actually injured badly in the course of having the implant and died, and these deaths were covered up by Neuralink. Now, 
I don't know. I can't attest to whether that's true or not. But we shouldn't forget that implants, at least at this point, uh, are a very risky thing to have. And, you know, I kind of think of um, the artificial heart, which, you know, really started to um, gain some momentum in the 60s and 70s. But how many artificial hearts do we really have right now? Almost none. And so some technologies that look really promising but have significant risks uh, with them sometimes don't take off. So I'd be like, I, I don't think an actual physical piece of metal screwed into your skull is going to be the root for what you're suggesting. But I don't disagree with you that it'll happen. It'll just happen in some way that we've figured out a better way of either reading the brain or reading instructions to the brain. Thanks, Charles. Uh, east of the Rockies, John in Alberta, Canada. You're on with Jay Ingram. How you doing, Jay? Pretty good. Where are Hello. you in Alberta? I'm in Calgary. Uh, Sony Plains. Just outside oh. Edmonton. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, what I'm wondering is if AI is sanctioned or sentient, uh, what do you think the chances of it to protect itself, uh, sending out invoices to humanity, getting them to build it some form of infrastructure so that if we do try and shut it down, it's got a backup someplace to go hide. And all it has to do is send out invoices to companies, get it to build whatever it wanted it to build, and then pay its bills. And as long as the bills are paid, I don't think too many people would ask too many questions about where the, you know, why am I building this? Well, somebody told me to build it, and they paid their bill really good. Oh, that's a, <laughs> I love that. That's a pretty dark view of, <laughs> of what could happen. But, you know, you're, you're hitting on a point, which is that people uh, who worry about AI, and like we've already said uh, tonight when George and I have been talking, that quite often that takes the form of robots, you know, creating mayhem. But in fact, if AI is... You know, there's this phrase, the Internet of Things, so that your fridge, your uh, speakers, your window shades, they're all connected by the Internet. And so you can imagine that an AI could easily take over control of your house and control all those things. Well, it wouldn't, you know, that wouldn't really kill you. But what it illustrates is that it doesn't have to have a pair of hands or a rifle, or, you know, a bazooka, or a missile launcher, or anything. It can control all the infrastructure of the life that we live. And so I, I don't even know if it matters that it's sentient. We don't even know if it can become sentient, or, you know, conscious would be another way of putting that. But um, I think when people are starting to think about this, how can we create artificial intelligence systems that have some sort of built-in safety valve that, for instance, they will never do anything that doesn't align with what humans want it to do. I don't know how you do that, but we have to be careful as we continue to make these things more possible. We have to be careful that we're building in little side roads that we can take them off if they start to be too threatening. Well, thank you for um, having me. It's been a blast. Thank you. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.